We are live. This is the first sitting of In The Metal, which is a video podcast that is going to look at the world of independent uh, watchmaking. And to do that there, I can't uh, do it on my own. It'd be very boring. So uh, we've got a, I've got a couple of friends who are coming along and uh, going to work with us. One of them is... Uh, well, one of them really needs no introduction. Uh, he is a master watchmaker. He is a guy who is bringing handmade hotel lodgery to the United States for the first time in generations. He's better known, perhaps, for his earlier career as a three times Grammy nominated, hell raising rock star. Six string shredder with anthrax, 30 million album sales. And I would like to welcome Mr. Dan Spitz, if you don't mind. Hey, Dan. Hey, what's going on there, bro? What's happening? <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, Dan, this is the, the first uh, episode. It's uh, I think it's, it's the prologue of... Uh, this little thing we've been talking about for the last two months or so, and uh, for one reason or another, it's it's taken until now. But uh, heck, here we are. It's the first uh, edition. Uh, I think of it as a prologue. And what I wanted to do was to uh, to let people know what we're about, what is independent watchmaking, how come it's heavy metal, and <laughs> let them know where we're going and uh, what to expect. And uh, as as we move forward this year, what about yourself? Oh, I'm doing good here. I'm just stuffed into my shop day and night here, as some people know. You know, creating this uh, this creation, this monster from within, um, day and night for almost well, past three years now, and just trying to represent my country um, as other independent watchmakers do. And that's what independent watchmaking truly is. It's uh, I really do think it is equivalent to the thrash metal that I helped lay the groundwork for in music. Whereas we have the unique ability as independent watchmakers in this era, finally, to have uh, the machines within our reach to create the art that is us. It's not corporate driven. It's not driven by, um, you know, five or six people around the table or 26 people around a table in suit and ties. Uh, trying to create, you know, a plethora of crap just to sell it. And that's what music was when I had music and listened to music. And that's what we weren't about back then. We were about wearing our jeans, wearing our T-shirt, because that's what I wear every day. And that's the way we got on stage. And when someone listened to our music, um, it was us. You, you got a piece of us. And that's what ind I see independent watchmaking has struggled to be from its onset but has plateaued now to be this massive, uh, incredible amount of art that is the top of the top, above the top, top of the top. Uh, just like the thrash metal music um, that we played was so intricate, it was compared to jazz. It was just off all the charts. And I, I think yeah. what, what myself and what our next guest has done for independent watchmaking, um, you know, should show it. Show, it speaks for itself, really. It's, it's beyond mortal. <laughs> so that's what we're here. We're here, we're here not to pull any punches and tell you, you know, you know, just speak the truth, just like I did in music. No, you know, yeah. we we don't have to answer to anybody. So why not just speak the truth about the really in-depth struggles we have in independent watchmaking each day and how we can help others, uh, like I'm, you know, trying to do here in the United States. For sure, uh, like for most people uh, who. Would be fans of independent watchmaking. We're used to having our watches that are coming from uh, Switzerland, or perhaps uh, do it's certainly it's very European centric uh, for for the large part. And you know, it, it's astonishing, really, that uh, for for the size of the the US market and the demand for outdoor luxury, fine brands, fine watches, there's nobody has been actually going right back to the roots, right back to the traditional hand-operated machinery to create these watches. And uh, 
it takes a man has to start a second career to do that. And uh, and you say you've been working on it for the last three years. Well, I suppose you know, Dan, you've been working on this for the last twenty five years, really, since you went to the Wostep Academy in Neuchatel and through the different schools and academies and uh, learning your skill, refining your art, getting to the point of the title of master watchmaker. So that is not the work of a moment. That takes uh, some doing and that takes some uh, determination, drive and discipline, which coming from the rock and roll background, you know, it's hard sometimes to imagine how you can focus on something so time consuming, so painstaking. And, uh, but you've done it. Well, it's, there's actually, there's many similarities, you know, um, as watchmakers, we got to lock ourselves in our room in complete silence. And, you know, um, you know, our boss is not a, a boss. Our boss is the piece of metal that's on our bench fighting us at all times. And we have to make it all fit together with this incredibly small little puzzle. And in music, we lock ourselves in our room with our instrument and we practice every waking hour. We breathe nonstop and we're all alone and we, we have the same extreme OCD qualities that every watchmaker has to become a great guitar player, a lead guitar player. You have, I mean, I haven't met a, a, a great guitar player that has extreme OCD and I haven't met a great watchmaker that doesn't have extreme OCD. I so it's the same, it's the same crap, man. Yeah, <laughs> fantastic. So uh, here, listen, we've got, uh, we wanted to tell people what to expect. So like, what is, uh, uh, I'm thinking in the metal uh, is a name that uh, in the metal is is an expression that you know for somebody like me living in Ireland I don't get to see uh, a lot of these watches. There's no uh, I'm not in Paris. I'm not in London. I'm not in uh, Munich or Geneva or Zurich where these watches are unveiled to the public for the first time. So very often all I see I get to see photographs of watches and uh, some. Sometimes I think to myself, uh, when I write about watches, I actually don't write about watches. I write about pictures of watches. So when I get to see a watch in person, that's what I call in the metal, seeing that watch in the metal. And so considering what you're doing, you're working with metal from taking fr from raw materials to creating a fantastic watch, a masterpiece. Uh, you're, 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 it, that's where the, the similarities with in the metal are, and so what we're going to do with with in the metal is to hopefully uh, have a chat yourself, myself, and some of the great characters, personalities, and individuals that are working in the watch industry who are the, the independent guys who typically are sat like you are there today, sitting in your atelier, and that's that's home to you. So uh, we're going to, I've just checked the list to see who we're going to be interviewing in the near future. And it just says everybody. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's, it's just time that, you know, the veil has been lifted and it's, it's, it's really hard as it was in the beginning days of, 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 of music, you know, to, to bring a forefront to these true artists that are literally working every waking hour to create these masterpieces and they don't have time for crap like this because it really isn't needed. There, yeah. Most of them, uh, now, most of us nowadays have a minimum of a two year waiting list and some over five years for, for our art. So we don't really have time for this. So there has to be something special about this to give back to other young watchmakers. Now that we do have this medium that I didn't have and our next guest didn't have when he started, um, yeah. we have this opportunity to, to shine a light both on what we do, but also to help other people who are thinking about going into watchmaking or a certain type of watchmaking and, um, and, and unmask some of these secrets that were true secrets that we couldn't learn without going to Switzerland to school when I had to do it. And that was not even a possibility to be an American and be, you know, end up at Wostep, you know, when Wostep was in its beginning stages, it was the only English speaking school in Switzerland where they only took like six or eight people, you know, it's, it's, it was just like ridiculousness back then. So we, we had this opportunities and I'm going to utilize that and I'm utilizing you. I'm, 
I'm going to waste your mind and waste your talent so that we can waste other people's minds. And, <laughs> and you get the drift, bro. That's, that's, we'll that's cool people so on, you know, so. I'm going to pull everything I can at him. And then I'm, we're going to talk about metal. We're going to talk about coffee. We're going to talk about cars and just regular shit, man. That all sounds exactly what I have ticked down here on my list of things that we have to talk about. So that's fantastic. So we've managed to reach from Ireland, from Warren Point uh, on the east coast of Ireland, right across to North Carolina. And I wonder, can we contact another guy in Ireland? And that would be John McGonagall, who is in Athlone Town. John, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good to, good. good to talk to you, Johnny. Good. Great to meet you, Dan. How you doing, John? Great. And you? It's my honor and my pleasure, my friend. One of my heroes, man. One of my heroes. <laughs> Thanks a million, Dan. It's great to see you in your environment there. Your, your workshop looks amazing. I've been following you on Instagram with uh, the development both of your workshop and of your, of your new watch. It's very exciting stuff. Thank you so much, sir. I, it, it brings me back to, to a time when uh, I used to stare at these little pictures, like I used to stare at album covers of your workshop behind your house, I think, right? When you were yeah, that's right, yeah. I was just staring at what, 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 kind of, what kind of files he got on his machine and what <laughs> on the desk. We only had pictures before this moving picture type stuff we had. So truthfully and honestly, um, you know, you are one of my heroes that, set me on this path but back then john i didn't know how you were doing that because it was a time where i think you you'll you'll admit we could you couldn't afford even a cnc machines back then they were like millions of dollars and only in the hands of the you know the big companies so you were doing everything you know by hand or reaching out to friends you had met along the way to have certain parts made that obviously you know we can't we can't make it it's an impossibility um and, and that just blew me away. And I didn't know how you guys were doing that. So, yeah, we were staring at pictures. And it's the same. I, I know, you know, you guys are metalheads over there, too, a little bit. So I'm sure you, yeah. when you were young, you were staring at an album. Well, when you play guitar, you're staring at, at an album and you're looking at Joe Perry from Mara Smith and you're like, what kind of strings is on that red guitar? How are you bringing it? Is the strings going over the bridge, or under the bridge? You know, it's the same crap that we have in watchmaking. And I know you got that too, bro. You got it somewhere. Yeah, so. it's exactly that, Dan. Yeah. Spirit thought for us when we were starting in watchmaking because uh, we didn't have the internet uh, back in 1989 when I left college. Uh, I used to write to all the companies and get brochures and try and glean my information from all this, um, you know, very edited and very uh, clinical photographs. And that was the only way I could get any information on watches other than what I'd find in a library. And um, so I, I, that's the reason I, I really had to go to Switzerland because uh, uh the information was so sparse and uh but uh it's uh it's fantastic now how we can both get information but for us watchmakers we can also give information we can show what we do we can show what sets our work apart from say the bigger companies who um have large research and development budgets and big r d departments and uh, and then you know production lines where everything is uh, is made, albeit in a very kind of rigid fashion. And I think what we do is is very different. It's very free flowing. It's very um, um, you, you know it, it's seat of the pants stuff. You're uh, <laughs> uh, when you have a problem, you know you you might be able to lift the phone and talk to friends and stuff like that, but you have to work it out and. Uh, they, everybody gets a piece of you, you know, it gets a piece of you, it gets a piece of how you were brought up, your family, whatever, how that affected you. You're, you're, it's your art, John, and you get to give that to the world. And it's going to be here for hundreds, if not thousands of years, the way you build your watches, thousands of years for sure. <laughs> uh, and, and that's not possible in that corporate watchmaking. And uh, I think we'll agree here that 
it takes someone like you and your bro who have also gone through the correct schooling and we we we've all, we've both worked on you know hundreds if not thousands of you know vintage watches to to gain our skills and see what what cool watches they were but what would stand the test of time after nine guys were inside you know with, with a craftsman screwdriver hacking away because they didn't have the right tools so we when we went to you know build our watches like I'm doing here and like you've been doing we we end up overbuilding everything because that's how we know it will last. Are we ever not stamped like the conglomerates to save pennies or or things like that? I mean, you're making your 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 thrash metal balance bridge out of titanium. I mean, that's badass, bro. It doesn't get any more badass than your balance bridge. That's it. How do you talk about it? Yeah. And it's true. I, I totally, but it's true. It's, I totally agree. It's true to say about restoration. That really has been the school for me. Like I still do. Um, I'm, I'm lucky enough to really attract really high-end piece of restoration now. And uh, each time I open up a piece that could be 100, 150 years old, uh, just it's an education. Like, you know, uh, I can't remember who was, who talked, who um, said that uh, walking around with a, a, a Brege, and when they said a Brege, they meant a, a genuine Abraham Louis Brege. Uh, whoever is a Brege in their pocket is walking around with the brains of the man himself in his pocket. When you open up a watch, it's full of ideas and it's uh, uh, it's amazing. Like, it's I'm still being schooled by restoration. You know? um, yeah, it, it doesn't uh, happen. I remember way back in some of my beginning years when I started taking apart. It might have been a very, very early Patek because I specialized in, in very, very old Patek restorations for a while. Um, and I was taking it apart and I got down and I lifted up one of the bridges and it was perlage underneath the bridge, underneath where the bridge, you know, screwed down to the plate. And I'm like, wait a minute. The only person on planet Earth that's ever going to see this is another watchmaker. Why would they even bother when they were producing, you know, a decent amount of watches back then uh, per year? But that's the stuff that blew me away, and just I just kept seeing that higher and higher level of wait a minute, they they didn't build this just to build it; they built this to be the best, to, to last forever, and and put that stamp on who they were. You know, we're not just crap. You know, we're we're cut above. And I think that's what independents are now. You know, we've we've come a long way uh, from from the idea of just um, you know being an, an independent. You know, like when Paul Gerber started. I think he kind of started some of this, you know, with his triple rotor and just attaching it mm -hmm. to, I mean, he, he's kind of like the thrash metal, one of the godfathers of this, uh, him and obviously VNA, but um, I look at Paul Gerber because he's just, he just, you know, he's an unsung hero who doesn't want to be sung. <laughs> uh, he's, he's incredible. Yeah. 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 He's, 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 he's the man. So, I mean, I look at that and the, the inception of it, he put his stamp on it back then when we knew we couldn't make main plates you know, to make a living at it, you know, I, I, I mean, I think we both know, John, we can only make maybe one or two watches tops a year if we were really trying to make everything ourselves without CNC. It's, it's you know, it's a, basically an impossibility to make a living at it. So he, he was, he, he put that stamp on it and, uh, and and it moved forward from there. And then, of course, VNA who popped it all, he's, you know, the thrash metal dude who just was thinking mm -hmm. out of the box and just basically said, you know, Fuck you! I'm going to do something completely off off the rails, you know. <laughs> but he's off the rails, so if you get it. You just like you said, John. If you own a VNA, you got a piece of him on your wrist or in your pocket, wherever you're going to put it. Yeah. You know what you guys do? Same thing. You you have and found your own, uh, not just the look, because that would be corporate. It, Everything, every little screw that you guys make, and everything is just you. I mean, it's it's unbelievable what you guys manufacture. It blows my mind. And you can't you can't get that in the corporate world. I mean, we, 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 you know, we, when the when it was the beginning of thrash metal, and that music came out, it was so different. Um, it was that same vibe. You know, you got a piece of us. It's real, you know, and and it's all right. it's not just manufactured music by people in the boardroom telling you what you should play, how it should play, because this is what's on the radio, and that's how the song will go, and it's not going to sell, and you're not going to 
you all this money to make all that music and go to the recording studio and hire a famous producer for three million dollars. So you got to do it my way. Well, independent watchmaking now is a wonderful thing that we can actually give to the world what we really are, and I, I find that. You know, it's incredible. It's, it's incredible for me to be able to talk to you and get some more of your insight. So, um, and hey, and for me, I, I agree with what you just said there, Dan. I, I, for a long time, I have been of the opinion that you know, an independent watch is an extension of the guy behind that watch. You know, mm -hmm. we look at the, as you said, Vianney, you look at the uh, Stephen Carpenter, like you know, how, how, how mm -hmm. much more. Personalized kind of kind of watch be it has its, it has its face on it down nearly you know and uh, so I always think that uh, independent watches that people invest you can see the personality of the watchmaker in that watch if you look at a a, a Ludovic Bayard you know it, it could only come from Ludo, you know yeah. uh, what could only come from Vianney if you know and uh, John and Stephen, what they did in, in Ireland, which, it, like, like, let's tell, I don't know if you know this, uh, uh, Dan, but in Ireland, like, watches aren't really currency at all. So for someone to choose the path of being a, a watchmaker and taking it on and on and on up that ladder to the level that John and Stephen have achieved, and, uh, you know, it, it's just... For, for a country that we don't really have a lot of uh, understanding of the, the value of a, of, of a rock, they're talking about the financial value. I'm talking about what actually represents. This is something that's fundamentally unchanged in three centuries. And the, the same methods, the same, okay, we've got electricity now, we've got tools that maybe make that job a, a, a little bit easier. Still, if you want to do anglage, if you want to do perlage or cut de genève, that takes time to do it. If you want to create a balance wheel or a titanium escapement wheel or something like that, there, you know, these are the, 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 the fundamentals of that haven't changed in so very long. So, yeah, it, it's amazing. And that's why, for, for what John has done and uh, his, his brothers. Yeah. What, what I'm trying, to, what I'm trying, I think both John and I are trying to get across to those who are listening, who are interested in this as a collector, or interested in this as a young watchmaker heading down a, a long path, and we're perhaps just a little bit along that path. When we did this, when we went to school, and I went to school, um, uh, it was like a secret society of the Swiss, and there were all these hidden secrets, and then we couldn't learn them unless somehow, some way, we got to Switzerland. And we found, and you know, we found most of that, obviously. You know, where they, they teach us these these secret, you know, these secrets. And then we have to apprentice for many, many years. And that still is really, you know, the only you know way to to learn is to do, and to have someone you know help you along in the beginning. And then you're on your own. You know, if, if you're a problem solver, you can move on, and it really with you and the watch, and you got to figure it out. Yeah, yeah. I think as well. Um, I, I think that. I'm sure, uh, John, um, John, I'll tell you because you were saying. How, oh, excuse me, John, just for one sec. Um, yeah. Uh, John was saying how you know he learned like me from from doing restorations, and we still learn. Both of us enjoy that. I mean, at shine, at, you can see that in his in his in his, his Tuscar, this movement. I mean. Like what I have, I have my full bridge, you know, and I'm saying oh, you know, to everybody, look at this, it's, this is amazing. I'm not doing that to be cool. I'm doing that because I've seen, you know, watches with many bridges and I prefer the solidity of this this accomplishment. And John's bridges are like, that's like 95% full plate anyway. So we both come from that same school of seeing so much. We want, we want that watch to last, for, you know, for forever. And he, he builds a brick shit house. It's freaking unbelievable. <laughs> well, listen, uh, first, uh, one thing, I, I don't think you're um, uh, up to speed with what's happened with uh, uh, with, with me and McGonagall Watches. Like, uh, um, I've moved on from McGonagall Watches and Stephen has taken it over. We're, both were in two different countries and it was incredibly difficult to actually work like that. And uh, we're both kind of um, 
trying to pull in our own respective directions. And we realized that it, it was challenging, you know, like you, you can see the, the Gronofeld brothers, they work incredibly well together, but they're in the same room, you know. And um, um, so we came to, you know, the conclusion that uh, one of us would have to take the lead on this. And uh, I had a few things I wanted to do and I have started to do it and it's it'll shortly come to fruition. But um, so Stephen's taken the mechanical brand and uh, what he's done with it since is incredible. Uh, like uh, he's really run with it, you know, and he's there's some extraordinary watches coming out very, very shortly. And uh, some pieces that have gone directly, uh, as you know, like uh, some clients, they were very, very protective about, very private about uh, the watches that are made for them. And so they're made, they're stunning, but they might never see the light of day. So there's a few of those watches, but there's some watches as well that you'll see shortly that Stephen has, has done his own. So, you know, um, I, I, I thought I should really point that out first. So uh, uh, tell us more about what you're doing and what your, your, your future is. We're, really, we're all really interested. Right. Uh, well, um, I'm starting a new brand very shortly. The Johnny has is up to speed on this and uh, he's come down and he's seen what I'm working on. And uh, um, I I don't want to say too much about it without showing it. I'd rather show rather than show and explain rather than explain because it would, um, uh, it makes more sense when you do both together, you know? But uh, what I'm attempting to do is uh, have the same high level of craftsmanship in uh, a watch that's a bit more accessible uh, but it's uh uh i've i i'm really thrilled with the, the results um what i can say is it, it's um uh, a traditional complication and it's finished to a very very high level and i'm uh, going to deliver them in non-precious metal cases because it's one of the things as you know which really slows us down and it's a big investment up front when you have uh, um, precious metal cases and to be honest i think an awful lot of the, the collectors are more interested with what's in the case rather than the case itself i mean it needs to be beautiful that goes without saying mm -hmm. but um, you know you could put something in a steel or a titanium case and uh if the mechanism if the craftsmanship is all there that's really what counts so yeah it's going to break cover that's wonderful the John. i'm so glad very, very soon. and uh you know we're here for whatever you need of course you know in the future and you know you're just a badass and and i and and i totally agree with you uh what's inside the watch as watchmakers, I think we know that, that you know, we, we're like, okay, that look, that watch is really cool looking and whatever, you know, but we're really interested in opening the back up and diving in just like a mechanic would want to dive in. He's a Porsche mechanic and, you know, a Ferrari pulls in or a Lambo, you know, he wants to dive in and see what's in there. Yeah, the car looks cool. That's great. But really, it's not that it's secondary, but it really is. And that's what true independent watchmakers who know their craft are really about. And I think it's really cool that we have this new kind of titanium as well. That's very light, but we can polish it uh, to mm, yeah. look like to look like white gold. You know, I mean, if you got a stainless steel case and you buy a white gold case, you know, that, that's a preference. I, 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 you know, when I was working at Show Part, I never really understood that. Why would you want to wear such a heavy watch? I get it, but we're really interested in the mechanics, which, as you know, if you can follow along what I'm doing, that's really what it's all about. You're seeing people get to see finally inside what we the struggles that me and john have when we're building something our idea and putting it together and making it work um it, it's it's that engine you know and we're trying to make a kick-ass engine that a super conglomerate could make you know because they have 20 people telling them they got to cut corners they got they can't make the pistons out of solid ceramic walls you know we're like you know fuck that we're going to make it the way we want to make it and we're going to make it out of the best shit we can make it and really that's what we're all about and and i commend you yeah. that. that's that's the way true watchmakers really do live our lives like the story about your watch has has started uh it's about the machines it's about the design it's about you know making the tools to make the bridges to make the components and 
that's the compelling part of the story. And the case is the very last thing, you know, it's like, it's yeah. a rapper. Yeah. 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 It better be a nice rapper, but like it's, it's the rapping. Um, but uh, one thing you, you mentioned there earlier on was about Paul Gerber, and that raises another uh, point um, that I think is often overlooked. I can't remember the name of the watch. It's a Latin name, Oro Mundi, something or other, okay? It's, it was the most complicated watch in the world at the time. Uh, it was, a, 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 I think, an Elise Piquet mm -hmm. clock watch or a Grand Sonnery uh, chiming watch that uh, this collector brought to Paul Gerber and he wanted a split seconds chronograph with, I think, power reserve indicators, sunrise, sunset, perpetual calendar. And uh, it was housed in a front muter case. You know, it was a front muter, it was sold as a front muter. Um, the, the risk he took with that was absolutely extraordinary. And he didn't use CNC. Like he was using a pantograph, he was using traditional tools, he was using, uh, you know, low jigs, make tons and tons of jigs to make each of the mechanisms. And at any point, he could have wrecked uh, beyond repair. That movement, and I, I like you're right. What you say, he's such a modest man, you know. When you meet him, he's so mild mannered and he's so accommodating and polite and unassuming. And uh, the guy's monster, like the thing he made is crazy. And he must have, to, he must have gone to bed a few nights going, Oh, I, I've I wrecked it. Uh, <laughs> I've gone too far. How am I gonna? How am I gonna get out of this? Yeah. Like, I mean, he, he did so much to it. That must have happened several times. And that heart and the mouth thing—that's, oh, that's that's cool. You know, that uh, that's real passion. I think you know. Yeah, his confidence, his passion, you know, his ingenuity and, and groundbreaking to me. Way back when, for me, when I was in school, just staring at little pictures of his first triple rotor and stuff, going, "How is he? How is he doing that?" and and how is he getting it all together? How is he making all this? You know, and it was back then it was still in his house. He's like he's like Van Halen in, in music. You know, when, when there's this, all these stories in music and I was there, you know, back when Van, the first Van Halen song went on the radio, the whole world, I, I remember reading something that Frank Zappa was driving along in his car and it came on and he's literally just, he just pulled off the road, like <laughs> stopped his car and was like in shock, like what the fuck is that? And you know, for me, that was that because it wasn't a guitar. What, what was that sound? How did he do it? Because there was no internet back then. You know, he modified all his own amplifiers by himself. He soldered everything and, and invented everything. And that's to me like what Paul Gerber was back then. It's like, wow, you know. I, and and where I'm getting with this is, if you look at him now, you'll see he's doing what I want to do for my country. Um, you know, and that's help young watchmakers. He has a prank, you know, two or three apprentices in his shop at all times, and he's passing on that knowledge and it's the old school knowledge that that John and I have. But in addition, we both, you know, we know he has a small, what I call prototype CNC machines in his in his home, and I won't clear that up for people because we are in the show going to be talking about all facets of how we manufacture our timepieces and how it really gets done, so we can actually eat food and go to the store and buy food with our masks on or later on, hopefully without our masks. Um, and, and he's embraced that technology, but I wanna just shed a little light because people think of CNC machines in our industry, like we just hold out our hand like this and the parts come off like bubble gum out, out of one of the little bubble gum machines and we just put it together. And that's not what we use. You know, we use prototype machines and they're made just so we can make 10 parts exactly the same and it's still raw. We still got to cut them out of the plates like we do uh, those certain parts that we do on that machine, just like we would do on our regular, you know, sixes, one on ones or Sierra F F1 milling machines. We still got to cut them out by hand, file them by hand, make them look like parts. They're really, really super raw. Uh, it's just we can make one watch number eight, watch number 18 and watch number 28, you know, with the same precision as watch number one. So I hope everyone can understand it's not speeding up our process that we can make 500 watches a year. It's just getting us maybe from one watch a year to hopefully, you know, seven or eight. Or if you're, you know, Roger W. Smith, he's pushing 10 and he's got the best machines known to mankind. So that should really put it all 
into perspective. I, I think what the CNC machine does is it, it brings um, the, you know, the idea from concept to, you know, metal quicker. For all intents and purposes, it's a very sophisticated uh, fret saw. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, yeah. As you say, afterwards, you have to do all the work. You know, it's, uh, you're getting, but you're getting precise points and you're getting a profile. And it's a starting point, you know. It's, it's a very valuable starting point. But mm -hmm. um, the craftsmanship kicks in after that, you know. It's, uh... Yeah, absolutely. It's it's like that's what I'm trying to say. It's, it's not a it's not this cookie cutter thing, you know. Because people who are not in our industry, John, sometimes they think, as I explained, that it just comes off the machine and it's done, and we just screw it together. And that is so far from the truth, especially for someone for someone like me. Well, I built my own machine from scratch from my own ideas to get the precision that we need. And I got that idea uh, from, from watching um, um, and, and seeing uh, the Japanese watchmaker, uh, Hajime Asoka. He built his own while he was stuck. Um, and Mark Jenny, who I think is the actual person who started this whole independence from your home. You can do it you know, a couple at a time when he built his own machine. Yeah, another, another unsung hero right there, Mark Jenny. I mean, oh, yeah. absolutely. Like, it, it was really innovative how he uh, made his uh, CNC machine, and uh, he, he was very generous with showing the steps with how he achieved it. Um, another interesting CNC machine is uh, uh, one made by uh, Vianne Halter. Um, oh. I had an opportunity to get a a milling machine of a, of a mutual friend and uh, I couldn't get it back in time. He needed to move very quickly and I, and I, I couldn't get back to Ireland in time um, because this, this thing weighed over half a ton. And um, uh, so I, I contacted Vianna and said, listen, I can't take this, do you want it? And he said, yeah, I think I can do something with that. So um, uh, he took the machine anyway and like his workshop is, full of machines many oh, of them yeah. never work oh, but, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he grabs everything he can uh, but anyway um i went to visit him um maybe a year or two later and he said uh, come here i'll show you what i've done with the machine uh that you could have had <laughs> and he converted it into cnc machine and the cooling first so the oil supply he uses the cooling he used the cooling system out of a volkswagen the control desk uh, it was uh, like something out of a 1980s uh, sci-fi sci program like this huge desk with a big uh, like green and black screen like green script on black you know and for some reason he had to reverse all the coordinates i don't know why he couldn't uh, play it so you know ar arrange it so that so it would work linearly but he had to reverse all the coordinates <laughs> to make it accurate. And uh, he uses that machine to this day. And but like, I was like- Is that the, same, uh, the, uh, the SIP machine or is that a different one? It's a different one. Uh, the, uh, it's, uh, it was a Fresu's, uh, I can't remember who made the machine. It's not the set though. Uh, Cause I know but, he uh, another monster that we've all seen with the, the little SIP jib bar slash measuring machine that he did the same yeah. kind of thing to so yeah yeah he's a madman i mean it's and, and you know like i i thought that he spent so much time on it that he could have bought a machine you know he could have sat on the bench made watches and bought a machine but i think he got so much from the he learned so much from the process yeah uh, you know um it was worth it uh, and, and i can relate to that um yeah, and I think we both agree now he can buy, you know, seven kerns and just stick them in there if he'd like to. <laughs> um, yeah. But he still has all that, you know, that old stuff there because he's a mad scientist. Uh, you know, we're all a little mad at what we do. And yeah. that, again, is what we're trying to show people that, you know, we're, we're not normal to do what we do here. You know, it, we weren't, I wasn't normal doing the music I did in my past and this is not normal to be locked up with all these machines or, or <laughs> try to acquire all these machines and restore them, buy two or three of each, find them from all over the world just to make a certain part of a certain part within that certain part to finish a certain way. We all have to buy these certain machines and find them. Luckily, 
Um, you know, industry has moved on to almost complete CNC in the larger brands, the corporate area, which enables someone like John or myself or other independents for those older machines that they would have put by the curb for us to grab. <laughs> and that's again, they're helping independent watchmakers all around the globe incredibly because I couldn't do this back in the 90s. It would be impossible. That's why I still was staring at pictures of John and his brother going like, how, you know, how are they doing this? You know, um, it was fascinating. And, uh, you know, and also to show it at VNA, you know, he embraces CNC as well. But again, it, I'll say it again. It's prototype CNC machines. If you look in VNA's boxes apart, they're raw. There's hundreds of hours of work to do on, on art. It's that's one thing about watchmaking, guys, that everything takes hundreds of hours, no matter whether it's, you know, it's uh, uh, make, making this, uh, screws, bluing, heat bluing parts, or uh, filing a bridge, sanding, uh, or uh, you know, polishing a bridge. And everything takes hundreds of hours to do and that, in, in independent watchmaking. And that's something that's not, What's you don't get that as you mentioned in the corporate end of it, uh, Dan, but it makes me think what we're talking about there. We've mentioned Paul Gerber, we've mentioned Mark Jenny, great friend of mine. Mark, uh, I, I think uh, he, he worked under Paul Gerber for, for, uh, mm, that's for right. 30 pages, yeah. And um, again, an amazing innovator. But you're saying like, you no, know, how odd it is and how difficult it is to do what you're doing now. Imagine what it was like when there was nobody else doing it and so there was no no reference there was nobody to you know go how's he doing that or how's it how's that being done because these guys and you you're talking about paul gerber with his sonnery and the most complicated watch in the world john and uh, how he adapted and modified it and created a module that that it sat and integrated with that historic uh, mechanism and um so you know it, it makes me think that you like uh, these guys who held, who kept the flame alive in the 70s and the the, the 80s when the quartz crisis was at its, at its strongest. So you had, uh, we mentioned earlier, John, uh, Philippe Dufour with Sven Anderson. We had uh, mm. Vincent Calabresi with, uh, you know, and, and Paul Gerber and, and people like that there who, when nobody else was doing this, they were doing it yeah. on a level that even no matter, no matter what money was thrown at it by the big companies, the big corporation could not achieve the kind of finishing, the the, the, the molecular tolerances. And you the, know. Other, the other thing that we have to get out there is someone like Paul Gerber, you know, he is what, 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 we, what I call a ghost builder, you know, and I have a lot of friends and, and I'm sure, you know, John has a lot of friends with, there's a lot of ghost building going on behind the scenes that the collectors should know about. And ghost building is exactly the same as when I when I grew up in music as, you know, you're a pop pop star and someone else is writing your music and the producer is producing it, you know, you're just you're just there. You're just told what to do as a puppet. So companies that that produce a, a large amount of timepieces but want to do a short run of one or two or five or 10, they would call up someone like a Paul Gerber and uh, even Patek Philippe, whatever, and say, this is what we want to do. It's not cost effective for us to do it within our walls and stop everybody in our assembly line. And those are the geniuses. And those are the geniuses that end up being hopefully independent watchmakers in the times that we're living in now. And, and I, 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 I totally agree with John about VNA. Look, look at VNA. He's, he's running a company. He has to produce watches to make a living. And he has people working there. But he stops everything and says, John, what kind of machine you got for me, bro? I'm gonna, rip, I'm gonna rip it apart. I'm stopping everything. I want to know how this stuff works, if I, you know. And he wants to be inside the mind of that machine, which I because because I built my own. Same thing. I have to know how everything works from the ground up. That's the reason I, 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 I spent a year of my life, you know, building my own machine. Like, you know, well, three machines yeah. actually. Right. I can relate. <laughs> Magically, the lights have come on around me here. That's suddenly <laughs> you were saying, Tommy, as well. Like, um, um, with um, thank you. You know, I, I worked in a, a big company in Switzerland, and uh, uh, I saw the good and the bad of it. Uh, 
like uh it, it you know when you go through the you'd have gone through plenty of factories down like when you're in wall step and you'd see pins being made wheels being made main plates bridges everything like that on an industrial scale and that is also fascinating you know and it's kind of overwhelming you think you know if i want to make a watch look what i'm up against you know it's not possible bingo and um but uh, we were, John and I were talking earlier on, and I, I thought that the two people um, that really um, showed what was possible were uh, George Daniels and Philippe Dufour. And um, I, th I think that uh, uh, the Swiss escapement uh, was such, uh, was so embedded that uh, we were told that anything else is, you know, it's not possible. It's an escapement, you know. There's a specialist, Niverox, they make escapements, you know, that's it, end of story. Um, Daniels kept on developing and refining his escapements until, you know, they reached a very high state of perfection. And uh, he was like, uh, and, and he went around banging on Swiss watchmaking companies' doors saying, and actually making, the escapements in their own watches. In a row. Like yeah, not not their own deed. In a role role. Role. <laughs> man. And um, uh, he was bringing it back to them. It was like, look, it works. And uh, he was doing that for maybe 15 years before he actually uh, got Amiga to take it. And uh, But uh, Philippe Dufour, um, like he's most well known, I suppose, for the simplicity. And I think that, um, that in a sense, it un undersells him. Because um, I was lucky enough to be a neighbor of Philippe's when uh, he was working on the Grand Sonnery and Duality. And um, we used to go up and visit him in the evenings and uh, just, uh, you know, he'd take out a bottle of wine, he'd be smoking the pipe, he'd be taking out old unfinished mechanisms and he'd show you what he was working on at the moment and everything like that. And it's, you know, it's funny how things like that kind of become... Uh, the new normal. This is like, uh, what do we do this evening? We go to the pub or up to Philippe's? We go up to Philippe's. And, um, but um, uh, no, we did appreciate at the time that this is pretty special stuff, you know? So when you went there, did, was he sitting you down and, and, you know, John, come over here, look at this, check this out, you know, and, and like so, so passionate that, you know, he oh, was yeah. throwing you away. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But he was, um, uh, I was, aware of um, grand sonneries that were being made by other companies. There weren't too many other companies and they were having massive problems. It, you know, it was to miniaturize a grand sonnery, to put it into a, a, a wristwatch was such a technological challenge. And then to add minutes to it, because the first one was a, a quarter repeater, but a minute repeater grand sonnery in a wristwatch, horribly difficult. You know, it took years and years and years of very clever, very smart watchmakers putting 100% into it to make it work. And this guy up in a <laughs> up in, in an attic in his own house managed to do it uh, in a wristwatch, and uh, he made it work. Um, I was up there one evening and. Uh, uh, I heard a grand sonnery go off in his safe. He had a huge big safe, it was the size of a big fridge. And uh, so a massive safe. And we were chatting away. The safe was at the other end of the workshop. And I heard the grand sonnery uh, going off. And I kind of looked at him, raised an eyebrow and said, uh, that's the pocket watch, right? And he was like, no, that's the rest of the watch. <laughs> I, I, oh I was blown away. So I think what he did there, um, even now, when I, you know, he, he based it on a pocket watch, he designed it on a 2D CAD package, which he trained himself yeah. uh, to use. And, um, and yeah, he used outside CNC and electro erosion people to actually create the parts, but, you know, he got the blanks back and had to do everything to make it work. And he did, did that as a one-man show. It def I'm blown away still. I, I, it defies uh, explanation here, you know. And uh, it's one of those stories that is even, uh, I think few people can actually understand how difficult it is what he did. 
Only only one of watch, only one of watch that, that you know can dive in that deep, you know, uh, someone yeah. such as yourself. And what what this shows to collectors and other watchmakers is the passion never ends. It's the same as music. You could you know golf. If you play golf, you're never gonna get that good, you know. And even if you are that guy on the top, you're still that guy on the top thinking I'm not good enough. I need to you know get to the next level. And he is another unsung hero that just recently his name is getting global attention uh, in our world. And he was very quietly behind the scenes for many, many years, as we all know. And, uh, you know, now he's giving back as well, John, right? He's teaching everyone how to do the finishing correctly, all the younger watchmakers, like Acrivia. I see pictures of those guys over there and he's giving back. And that's what we have to do. You know, once we are able to is, you know, inspect other people's work, give them honest opinions and guide them on their path. Don't, you know, don't, don't um, distract them from confidence, push them to go further. Just like, you know, any other, uh, like a guitar teacher would teach someone uh, taking a guitar lesson, you know, never reprimand, just show that you can get better. You can, you know, this is the way, this is the trick. Here's the secret sauce again. You know, Dufour has his secret sauce to finishing that everyone wants to see. <laughs> Which he is more than willing to show to anyone. Uh, he's the most incredibly generous man when it comes to ideas. Like, uh, he holds nothing back. He'll tell you everything. And uh, he, the hilarious thing is he went to all of, so many of the top companies in the industry to offer his services. And they, they weren't interested because um, if there's one thing that the, a lot, that, doesn't fit very well in a watch, a big watch company in the traditional sense, is an individual. Like you have to be a unit in a team to put the watch together. Whereas um, that's very, that's very anti independent watchmaker. Like the independent watchmakers are the square peg that won't fit in the round hole. They will want to do it their way. Um, they, I used to get really bored after getting reaching a certain quota of pieces and I used to start beveling my tools and stuff like that. And uh, you know, I, I was going nuts on the production line and I kept on pushing, pushing, pushing until they eventually found a workshop for me. And I'm very grateful for them to them for that. Um, but um, in uh, most of the companies, no. if you no. get someone sticking their head above the power pit, no. they're no. troublemakers. No. They're not well. What you're saying, because I was in Geneva working, you know, at Chopard and, and in the complication room. And, um, you know, it, it was cool for a little while. And then it's that day to day grind for someone like me. It, it wasn't for me. You know, I come, my background is anti disestablishment and do things my own way. So I'm never going to fit in. But I was there to suck knowledge from anyone and everywhere I could. And I knew, I, you know, I, I had to have my own place, my own restoration place or something because I really did want to make my own timepiece back then, but I, I just couldn't. It, it was, you know, not possible. Even after, you know, doing four-year school here and apprenticing for four or five years, and then, you know, I, I grew up in my grandfather's jewelry store, and then Woe Step, and then Complications, and then onto Show Park. We don't fit in there, you know, you just know it. And that's why... None, none of us can uh, um, really guide another watchmaker because we they might come out of school as a young watchmaker, but throughout their lifelong career in watchmaking, they might shift and say, hey, this is not for me. This is really where I want to go at this portion of my watchmaking career. And then they might shift again and might shift again. So we just got to let people be themselves and, and you know, give that whatever they are, the greatest problem solving they should, you know, be really wonderful at servicing uh, after sales service. You know, if they have come from a corporate mentality in their family and whatnot, they might fit right in to do something like that and be a great asset to those companies. But for independent watchmaking, we don't fit in anywhere. We're just like the punks that, you know, just like we're going to do what we we're going to do. and We're going to do it better than anybody else. We're going to do it our way. And if you don't like it, you know, go fuck yourself. Buy my shit. <laughs> the most important thing I think... That's what it is, right? You're right, man. The thing, the thing that's more important. Than I can relate to the, to the Dufour story because look at me. I'm sitting here with with a completely different escapement, and I think as watchmakers, we know that's that's you know that's the badass stuff right there. 
And it, you know, my escapement is is an open source escapement, which is a new thing for watchmaking. Mm. Um, that was started by my really good friend and another ghost builder that everyone on planet Earth should know about, and that's Luke Minton Bonet of Arts Mechanics. Mm. One of the most badass watchmakers, again, young watchmakers, I call him young, he's not super young, but walking our planet. He doesn't want to be, he, he wants to be quiet and behind the scenes, but he's created some of the most badass parts for some Sorry. of Sorry, it's Luke de Bonnet. Monet. Monet, okay, oh yeah, sorry. Arts Mechanics. Uh, yeah, 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 I know the man you're talking about, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, he's part of, you know, the Grubel 4 c and, you know, I won't name them if I shouldn't, but uh, he makes a lot of parts. And him and Cyril <laughs> Bervais, Lothar, which is one of his students, we have worked uh, under Luke for two, three years, and Luke, uh, they helped co-develop uh, and resurrected the Libra eccentric uh, escapement that I'm utilizing. So the plans are available, the basic plans, as part of the open source thing that we're all doing, and then the idea is to build upon it and make it your own. And that's how watchmaking really should be, as far as I'm concerned. All the patents have worn out anyway. You can, we can all pretty much do what we'd like at this point, um, you know, unless you're someone like Ludovic Bayard, or you know, he's he's so wonderfully twisted, <laughs> you can't copy his stuff. <laughs> you know, and I think we all know that backstory to him and where he used to work and who stole his shit too. Yeah, yeah, you know what it is. yeah that's, that's just horrible. And you should boycott that motherfucker. Pardon my language. Really, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I'm with you. I agree 100. We can all see as watchmakers. Who made that mechanism? Come on, man. That's not yeah. fair. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, we'll move on. Yeah. Wow. wow. Yeah, he's a badass watchmaker. That, I mean, that's just, he's part of, he's like thrash metal too. It's like, this is what I do. Screw you. Yeah. I love it. No, he, he's, he's an incredible character. It's, but his work is absolutely beautiful. And Amazing. it's really outside the box as well, you know, and uh, it seems to come so easy to him as well. You know, and look, look at the move, look at the movement he's working with. I mean, that's that's really a small, small movement. He's still so working with it's the same movement that that uh, Paul Derby started with with the triple rotor. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's really fine watchmaking. It's uh, he's working to really tight tolerances with that watch, and I, I, it works so well immediately. You know, out of the box. Uh, yeah. No, he's he's smart. Yeah. 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 Such an original idea, you know, that that's definitely something that, you know, he knew right away I had to patent it. And I know he created that in a pissed off mode. In like six or, six or eight months, he had, you know, designed it and had the piece, most of the pieces royally finished on a prototype CNC machine. Yeah. He finished everything. And that shows you how pissed off he was from where he left. Okay, guys, quick money, you can all put it together. <laughs> Dan, Dan, tell me about your watch. Like, oh, how far, how far along are you with the process? Well, I've been working seven days a week pretty much for three years now. The first year was a lot of restoration of the correct machines that I needed, the vintage machines, and setting up the shop. Second year was the design of my uh, CNC machine that would make uh, the raw parts for in just inside the watch, um, and also was still. You know, starting with my CAD and CAM, uh, going to school for CAD, CAM, and uh, the design of my watch. And um, now the parts are on my bench, and they're being finished and fit together. And and um, I'm, right now I'm in the middle of the escapement as a, of my own design. And it's picking and um, trying different um, uses of titanium and different types of titanium within the escapement as the escapement is gonna be all titanium, meaning uh, I've produced the escape wheel in-house, which as you, we know, John is, you know, using the lever escapement, I couldn't have done that here. So I really did wanna produce everything here. Um, and that's one of the main reasons I did, you know, uh, jump on the this uh, open source escapement. Um, and it's, you know, it works, it's, it's unbelievable. And to produce my own escape wheel right in-house out of titanium, is it blows my mind to look at it, you know? <laughs> awesome, yeah, it really is. Yeah. yeah. So, so as John was saying, uh, when do you think uh, you, you'll be? Uh, we'll see. Uh, if, if it'll break cover when will we see it in the in the, in the metal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I would say within the next six months, the, the movement will be complete. 
fantastic. I think uh, using titanium for the escape wheel is a smart move because it's uh, um, the I, the gold was never a good material for an escape wheel, and that was traditionally what was used in the detent, which your escapement is loosely based on. Yeah. It's it's the, a very similar principle. It's kind of a hybrid between an anchor and a detent, right? That's correct. And, That's correct. Uh, um, which makes, because the problem with desert, as people may know, is uh, it's suitable for a pocket watch, but it, it can't sustain shocks. Um, it'll unlock and awful damage can occur and everything like that. Uh, but it's the holy grail of escapements, yeah. you know, a workable detent in a, in a, in a wristwatch. But um, the, uh, each time the escapement has to accelerate uh, the moment of inertia is so much higher on a gold escape wheel. Uh, I mean, it's it makes a massive difference to the amplitude and uh, mm-hmm. power and power reserve and everything like that. So yeah. I think it's, it's, I think it's fantastic. Push, uh, the, the, that, that escape and then shrinking it down to wristwatch and, and having a safety spring on it, uh, which I just actually produced I, what I think might be the smallest titanium spring <laughs> known to mankind here the other day. So the unlocking that, spring is titanium. Yeah, I just produced it. Yes. Wow. It, it's wow. My, it's blowing my mind. I, I'm so right on my desk. There's two or three of them, um, and it's um, 0.03 thickness, 0.2 millimeters high by like eight or nine millimeters long, yeah. uh, and it's taken a while and a lot of patience. So even the whole lever, uh, the counterbalance, everything is all titanium for the same reasons you, you just stated, along with having the escape wheel there. Uh, and even the large roller and mini roller, they're all titanium. So it, it makes everything not only n- n- not have the need for oil, but um, it, it's like it's air moving. It's not even, they're not even gears or anything. There's no weight to anything. It's, it, and and it, it should it should theoretically last forever. Nothing should should wear as long as nobody's in there hacking. And have you got the curved locking stones, or are they straight? They're straight, straight, just as a lever stone would be. There's very little depth in anyway. No recoil shutters and very recoil zero yeah. zero recoil zero. It's almost like zero fresh in and needing no oil. That's what blows my mind. What 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 loop, what loop has done? to shrink this down and modernize it. Um, you know, I've changed it considerably, but what he's done and what Cyril you know, has in his watch ticking, I don't know why that's not getting like press up the yin yang because it's mind blowing what's going on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's amazing too, yeah, I love that. It's interesting, it's just one of those pieces that just stood out. It's so traditional in its aesthetics, it's, do you know, it, it looks like it could have come from 200 years ago. There's no crown on it. It's wound from behind with the key, which is just... Uh, a, you know, the other, the other thing is there's a lot of, um, because of the modernization of technology, you know, we even have, you know, um, um, hair springs that are no longer flat anymore again for the wrist mark. Yeah. yeah. So if you can take that hint a little bit and see where I'm going to go with, you know, number two, this escapement, okay. it, this escapement can help a lot of independent watchmakers. The main, other main reason I'm doing this, yeah, it's badass. Yeah, it goes against all the rules. Yeah, I don't want to buy myself wheels and be, you know, be stuck to an escapement that comes out of another uh, timepiece. But also, it enables any watchmaker who's an independent, you know, to make their own escape wheels and escapement. It can be done in house, mm-hmm. literally in their house. That opens up huge doors. It's not easy. It's, believe me, this is not easy. This is difficult. Um, but uh, us sharing this knowledge to the world through uh, through the through the through this these avenues, you know, it it, it can give someone independence from the brands from having to buy parts. I, I think as well that it strikes me that uh, it would be easier to set up, and I don't mean easy. I know it's not easy, but easier to set up than the Daniels escapement. I think. The Daniels escapement um, is more complicated in the number of steps, you know, because the impulse sometimes is coming from uh, directly from the wheel and sometimes the lever, like on each successive stroke. 
Whereas uh, the escapement you're using, it's much more, it's pure, it's more simple. It's very simplistic, even though there's extra parts, but it is very simplistic in, it, in its function once it's running. Um, and if you understand the level of escapement, it's a no brainer. Yep. Yeah. yeah, we're both on the same page. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I've I've changed it. I've I've extended the uh, the pallet lever fork and and enlarged the roller from its original design. But that's just because I decided I wanted to do a very large uh, balance wheel, also made out of titanium, and you know for its inertia and, and run the watch at a slow eighteen thousand train, and mm -hmm. it seems to work wonderfully all together. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so. Well, that was a table, but I'm going to tell you, we have run on now to about 65 minutes. And um, we've had uh, a lot of people have left a comment tonight. And uh, we'd like to say, Joe, to, to thank everybody for having popped in. Uh, local guy, Marty Patterson, big anthrax man. He couldn't believe it. Hey, wait, um, wait, 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 hold up here, because this is supposed to, I want to ask John some metal stuff now. So, John, oh, get going. Get you going. You got to tell us a few things. Here's what you got to tell us: what music you listen to. Uh, do you listen to music ever when you're working on timepieces? What music does your brother listen to when he's working on timepieces? And uh, a funny story about you maybe working in a factory, working by yourself with other dudes who are listening to music, perhaps. Okay, um, I was more of a, a grunge guy, and I still listen to an awful lot. Like, I love uh, Alice in Chains, Soundgarden, uh, bands like that. And uh, I think Stephen, um, well, he introduced me to Queens of the Stone Age, and I know he's big into Rage Against the Machine, and uh, Audio Slave, bands like that. And But I listen to a cross-section of music as well, because, you know, as the mood takes me, you know, I could be listening to... Nick Drake, I could be listening to, uh, um, I listen to a lot of Beck. I think he's never produced a bad album. Uh, you know, like uh, I, I love music and listen to it a lot in work, but I also listen to podcasts and stuff like that as well. Uh, it, having something playing really helps uh, to get you into the zone and just, you know, just the watchmaking flows when you're listening to something. Um, um, funny music in, in like when I worked in Clara, uh, you know, like in the factories, you had uh, um, uh, you know, people would have their earphones in, that'd be that, you know, like uh, you'd walk into a, a, a workshop in a big company and you'd have just silence, you know. Uh, when I worked in Clara, uh, I think the average age in there must have been in the low 20s. And uh, we were all really young and uh, and hungry, and like we're working um, seven days a week for a lot of the time, uh, de developing prototypes, miniature repeaters, perpetual calendars, the second chronographs, stuff like that. And um, we were allowed kind of go a bit nuts. So like uh, uh, there was always music blaring out, uh, and uh, I think. Visitors to the factory, they did like all the watchmakers on the top floor. They used to look up and kind of go, What kind of map is this? You know, they get this beautiful chateau and everything like that, and everything's very elegant. And you could have the stone roses blaring out the window and stuff like that. So, uh, uh, but uh, I think there were a couple of characters in there who didn't like the music that was played. It was kind of shit. It was a brilliant environment. Like, uh, so what, what we're trying to show is here, obviously, you know, there is some coolness factor to watchmaking, which I didn't know. You know, I didn't know until, again, I was into it and, you know, people had their headphones in and blasting Slayer and stuff like that, you know, in my room. And they weren't blasting it because they knew who I was. We listen to music when we're actually uh, taking stuff apart. And someone like John could have, you know, a few million dollars worth of parts all spewed all over his bench that he's got to, you know, put together. and or repair or whatever he's he's doing at that time. And he could be blasting Queens of the Stone Age, you know? And, and who would have ever thought that, you know, watchmakers are, you know, that's that's the music we listen to. You, everyone probably thinks we'd be listening to classical music or something. It's actually the, the raucous stuff is soothing. 
it's yeah. in a funny way you know like you you have to be really calm on one level but this is just this is it's a release you know it's great I didn't. I, well, blue, 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 that's a great story, John. By the way, so it's the Claret's. It's just metal, you know, it's a metal place to work. So if you're looking for a job, young watchmakers, go to Claret and blast up some Slayer and some other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that, that same kind of story happened to me. And when I was uh, at the sh at show part, I I was peering over some some dude who had a bunch of stuff all over his desk. He had a couple of repeaters and and uh, some flyback chronographs, like three or four going at once. And you know, I'm, I'm I'm looking down. I'm like, wow, this guy's you know, he's a badass man. And I look down, and like on his desk, you know, he's, he's got a big Slayer sticker, and it's just blasting. He doesn't even know I'm standing behind him. And then finally, I look over, and he goes, "Spitz, you!" He starts yelling at me. And I'm like, "What are you listening to, bro?" He's like, "Slayer, Slayer, Slayer." Uh, I, I just couldn't believe it, you know. And and that's the day. Actually, it was it was. I think I had enough at the end of that. I was there for I don't know how long. And it was a cold, you know, Swiss winter. And I got on the phone with my bud, Dave Mustaine from, from Megadeth. And I said, I, I think I'm done, bro. <laughs> I think this is a blasting slayer here. Uh, I, I don't know what to say, man. I, I think I've learned enough and I need to come home. <laughs> yeah. As the same for me, uh, because uh, when, when, when the world gets back to normal again and I get the, the, the house to myself at about uh, 8.15 in the morning, there's nothing I like better than Numa by uh, Tool <laughs> cranked right up at about eight thirty in the morning, and uh, it gets you in your groove. So it does for the day. I I love it. Like it does. It's driving music, isn't it? Really. I found I found for myself actually uh, that old jazz. You know that my grand my father listened to a lot. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Dizzy Gillespie and all that kind of stuff. Mm. That, that's also really good. That's a uh, that everyone kind of enjoys and it's kind of soothing i think it also um we'll find out as we go along in the series of interviews but i think it's also what we're working on as watchmakers sometimes dictates what we'll choose out of that catalog because what mood is it in what part of the watch are we working on today what are we in the mood that won't you know make make me like so jittery i'm gonna destroy this stuff that's on my bench <laughs> <laughs> I listen to I listen to classical. I love Chopin, uh, but if I'm on the machines, like the machines are noisy, and yeah. I don't like wearing headphones. So when I'm on the machines, it's very loud music, <laughs> always. So uh, and, uh, well, we're bringing some coolness, you know, to watch making. That's that's the goal here. You know, we're not these, you know, these stuffy totally. dudes stuffed in a little woodshed on the top of a Swiss mountain, even though that's where me and John did end up somehow, some way for a little while. <laughs> you know, yeah. we're kinda, you know, there, there's definitely- you're, saying, like, you're bringing coolness to it. Uh, <laughs> here, you know, uh, Bernard Wadding, who knew watchmaking was so rock and roll. Adrian Curran, Dan, you still playing the guitar? Of course you are. We're gonna need a theme tune for this thing, man. Oh no. Oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> Well, John, listen, I hope you're safe and sound over there during these troubled times and, uh, you know, keep safe. And, you know, I know we wear the white coat sometimes, but I don't know about the white coat with the white mask. I think we want you to get a little bit too far. Yeah, <laughs> yeah listen, you stay safe too and keep up that extraordinary work. Uh, I'm dying to see the results. You as well. We, we all, the whole world, you know, that, that follows independent watchmaking, um, we're glad to, to bring the news of what your, your new stuff that you're doing to the world. And we're all waiting in anticipation. Anytime you want to show anything, even if it's just a piece of whatever, uh, please just, just ring me and Johnny up. Fantastic. Absolutely. Absolutely. Johnny, thanks a million for including ah. us on this first. Uh, I, I know this format will work for you. It's brilliant. And uh, you're the man for bringing people together. So good it's good fun, it. John. That's the most. Uh, Joe, uh, yeah. uh, Dan, we, we, we spoke about this, and Dan felt it, Joe, it's, it's an enlightening uh, watchmaking. And Joe, you know, because watchmaking is, it, it has that uh, sort of a staid, very sober and reserved, very yeah. straight up and down sort of uh, people see it that way. But the characters that are inside this industry are as rock and roll as you can imagine. And uh, so, look, it's been an absolute pleasure having you here on uh, tonight. Uh, you really helped this thing get off the ground. It's our first night. Uh, I, 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 
I, I have loved it. I, I don't know where the time has gone. And uh, so I, I, I'm thrilled to have had you along. And, uh, and Dan, for yourself, man, what a thing to do, like, you know, uh, to have uh, three times Grammy nominated Watchmaster, Watchmaker, 30 million albums, the whole thing. Like, I'm just a normal dude stuck in my warehouse here with a bunch of old machines, bro. <laughs> <laughs> We're all just nuts, bro. We're all trapped right now. Yeah, we're just out. <laughs> I'd just like to point out to everybody at home, um, it doesn't say in the metal scrawled on my wall. That's Johnny's work. <laughs> <laughs> but I might no, do it out of your wall, there, man. <laughs> Scratch it off. <laughs> you know what? Watchmakers uh, are the only people on the planet right now who staying indoors and all the laws and rules that are, it doesn't affect us whatsoever. <laughs> so we don't leave anyway. <laughs> Nothing has changed. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been this has been an absolute blast, and uh, all like all day long, I have been I have been freaking nervous, and I'm going shit. I hope everyone yeah. works here. And, we and, you know what? It has been great. Get it together, bro. You the Can't man. Wait to be the next one. We all love you. So, uh, it's a, it, it might. <laughs> A week seems like a long time away, but let's let's look at doing that, and uh, we'll get a few ideas together, and we will uh, bring the people another hour or so of kick-ass rock and roll, hot or luxury, and uh, we'll, we'll get back to you all with, with that. Okay, this has been a pleasure, guys. Bye bye now. Thank you very much, John McDonald, the master watchmaker from Athlone in Ireland. Thank you so much indeed. Dan Spit, Danny Spit, he's the man with the six string shredder. And uh, we can't wait to see your new work. I'm looking forward to catching up with you again next week. You look after yourself. Thanks, everybody. Take care, guys. Yeah. Okay.